Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back to the Be Unbound podcast. I am your host, David Rethemeyer, joined, as always, by my co-host, Abraham Chen. This is the final episode of Pursuits for Season 5, and we are joined by some high-flying students for this episode. Abe, tell us who we get to have a conversation with today. Yes, sir. Well, David, I will say that we've saved one of the more interesting ones uh, for the last Pursuits for sure. Um, I mean, you tell me, David, how many times have you almost died on your job? Uh, you know, considering the fact that I have a desk job and I have for the past five years, the closest I ever came was using an industrial meat slicer in a restaurant. And that was <laughs> that was just maybe maybe potentially losing a finger, but uh, nowhere close to dying. So I think these guys have a leg up on me there. Mm. Well, I mean, that is pretty dangerous. Speaking of fingers, we will have stories about fingers and appendages today. Uh -oh. um, some of it, I believe. <laughs> So, yes, we are talking with our flyers. Uh, there are uh, more risky stories of almost dying, but there are so many tips for our unbounders or other students who are listening who might be interested in looking into aviation or going into pilot school, getting their pilot's license. And there are some very sweet moments. Uh, I'm so excited to sit down with Amy Comber, an OG within the community, Ivana, who is even more OG, and uh, she actually has an episode on our podcast already way back in the day. So I recommend you guys uh, listen to that. We will shout out that. I have my own brother, Andrew Chen, who works in the aviation industry as a manager at JFK International Airport. We have Kian, who is someone who is working towards his pilot's license, a wide a range of different experiences and uh, modes in flying in, in aviation. Um, so I will let them introduce themselves. David, let's uh, get into the episode. Absolutely. I uh, am very much looking forward to hearing from each of them and all of the stories they have for us. So without further ado, please enjoy the episode. Hello, guys. Welcome on to the show. We are talking with our aviation people. And so let's jump right into it. I want you to tell us uh, your name. Uh, but more specifically where you are, because we're on Bounders, we're all over the place. And also tell us the years you were involved uh, as a student with Unbound or as student leadership. Uh, Amy, we'll start with you. Ooh, okay, so my name is Amy Comber. I am currently located in northern Idaho. It's been snowing nonstop. And I was a part of Unbound Abe, keep me honest. I think it was 2014 through 2018. Um, I was a part of two different cabinets and then planned a myriad of different events and just kind of bounced around and met a ton of people <laughs> so, and got, got the degree too. Like that was part of it. So <laughs> mm, there you go. That's Amy. She, uh, yeah, was very instrumental in getting me to my first event. So shout out to Amy, uh, Ivana, I'll let you go next. Hey everyone. My name is Ivana Ontiveros. I'm currently in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I've never left, but you know, I also work from home. So, uh, that's the thing about unbound. It's like, where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you from? Um, I was a part of unbound. I'm going to have to beat you, Amy. It was in 2013, <laughs> all the way from 2013 to 2018. When I then became a Liberty university student online, I still stayed on anthill like religiously. Cause that was, those were my people. So I was on Ant Hill till I graduated in 2021. I actually did the graduation with uh, Apex in 2021. So I guess you could say from 2013 to 2021, but that's it. Loved having you at 2021. I mean, yes. I, I mean, we start with Amy, like again, but yeah, Ivana, you have us beat with being OG. So we do have some amazing OG people. So glad that you guys are on again. Uh, Ivana, she has been on the podcast you're actually no stranger way back i think this was two years ago at this point at least you did an episode with our um producer ben about aviation so this is like a sequel for you i'm very excited to hear the updated story and where you are with all that now we have some of our newer ascend students our year twos our sophomores so uh kian where are you at um, yeah, I'm Kean Bishop. I'm currently in South Dakota, but I live in Missouri at the moment, but I'm back home visiting for family. 
uh, kind of unexpected visit, but it's Thanksgiving and I came early. So, um, and as far as Unbound involvement, just started last year and uh, I, I've got nothing under my belt here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, excited for you to uh, continue on. And definitely not uh, least is uh, Andrew Chen. How's it going, everyone? I'm Andrew Chen. Um, I'm currently in New York City. Um, last name sounds very, very familiar to whoever's listening. Um, yes, I'm Abe's younger brother. So we are both in New York City. Um, so I'm also similar to Kian. Uh, we both attend our Apex uh, last year, and we're currently both ascend year two and um it's been a pleasure with unbound all right well uh i think we have a fascinating variety uh even within aviation here um we have andrew my little brother who works at john f kennedy international and we have you know a bunch of pilots uh, in, in the various stages so let's just get into it um Tell us a little bit about your history with flying, like how much have you done? And um, let's just kind of also say what got you started. So once again, Amy, tell us about uh, where you are with your licenses and yeah, what you do right now. I love that. I love how you phrase it too, Abe. You're like, what got you started? And I was like, man, I feel like I was four years old and just always waving in airplanes. And then I kept wondering, I was like, who's in these planes and where are they going? And it was just this really wonder filled thing for me, um, which slowly translated to, I wanted to sit in the seat. And it was like a long journey for me to even realize that I wanted to sit in that seat. But I'm currently pursuing a private pilot's license. I am more than halfway through it. It's kind of hard to judge with all of the hours. Um, but working towards it, almost ready to take the test and then working towards the the flight as well. So it's good. I can land a plane. So they, they told me lesson one. They sat me down. They're like, it's important that you can, you know, take off, but it's it's extra important that you can land it. So I think we're inclined to agree. There we go. <laughs> I mean, um, your life literally depends on it. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Either that or you're a bit too unbound with being adventurous. Um, yeah. And Kian, you are have your private license as well, I believe, right? Tell us about that. I No, I don't have my private right now. I was supposed to have that right before I joined Unbound, but then I smashed the tail end of my plane into a tractor and that kind of put a big damper <laughs> on that. Um, well, I was going to ask so, about that story. Yes. <laughs> so, well, yes, yeah, so that's, that's kind of, I guess, Unbound was a backup plan because um, I I was I was expecting to be to be flying, but yeah. By the way, uh, pro tip: don't do that. It's a big pain in the butt. But yeah, so I I haven't done a whole lot with flying as of recently, just because of that mess. But before I was pursuing my uh, private pilot's license and did the written test. That's since expired, so that's how long that's been. Um, and was about was a week away from taking my check ride when I smashed the tail end of that plane. So, um, yeah, I'll be back at some point. But for right now, that's just where I'm at. So did everything in a tail wheel, which was like a little bit different. I, I enjoyed that a lot, though. So where I got started was actually my grandpa. He's a crop duster for 25 years um, when my mom was a kid. So he always had planes and uh you know growing up going to grandpa's place we'd often get to ride in the plane and so that first plane that he you know took me for flights in when i was like a little guy letting me take the stick a little bit when i was you know seven or so and then uh that was the same plane that i got to learn how to fly in and took my first solo flight in and all of that so that was pretty cool that's awesome yeah i mean like all the different stories and aspects. So um, <laughs> hopefully some from that as well. And um, Ivana, tell us about like, I think you've had some experience uh, with this as well. So tell us about that. Right. Well, so I have um, my commercial certificate as well as instrument rating, obviously private. I have about 300 hours right now. And because I went to Liberty University online and did the aviation courses and got the degree, 
Um, I only need to reach a thousand hours to go to the airlines. So technically I only need like 700 more hours. Um, so that's where I'm at currently with that is that I graduated. I got the degree of 300 hours. I'm in a really good position to become a flight instructor. Um, but I kind of ran out of money. <laughs> so because <laughs> if there's one Life? thing that mm-hmm. you should know about aviation, I said it's very expensive. Um, but that's, that's the goal. It's like, how much do you love this? Um, what are you willing to do for this? And every hero's journey needs a little bit of tension and a little bit of an impossible situation. So I feel like money tends to be that impossible variable. Um, but from what, what grabs, what captured my attention with aviation started with the mission trip actually. And I was an unbound student during this time and pretty similar to Amy's experience. It took me years of my life to really see aviation for what it was. And then also it took even longer to realize that I could do it. (laughs) So um, I never knew that general aviation existed. I just thought that there were big planes at airports and that's how that works until the mission trip when we were on not a big plane and we were at a small airport that I realized how freeing general aviation is, how much of quote unquote, like the big boy life up in the sky can still happen in the context of like a small flight deck. And I just rode in the front on the way back. And just when I took control, because the pilot let me fly, air quotes around flying, you know, (laughs) move it back and forth. Yay, right? But when that happened, it was so crazy because so much was communicated in the simple movement of the yoke that I felt. It was like um, a multi-sensory experience. And I realized that I loved the responsibility aspect more than anything else that in that moment I was navigating this aircraft, but I was also in charge of the people that were sleeping tired from the mission trip, like right behind me, most of which were some of my favorite friends, best people I've ever known from church. And that feeling that I was in charge of their lives, I felt worthy of it. And that completely infected my brain. And, um, that's, that's what got me started. That's, but I didn't act on it because that's the thing. If you talk to pilots, sometimes that gap between the love for it and then acting on it, sometimes that's a, a short gap or a big gap. But for me, it was, like I said, like about two years before I actually did anything about it. But that's, that's okay because that's part of like that grand story of aviation and love and pretty much like how God calls you into it. I love all that. And we will again touch on, on some of the, the story and, and your continual journey uh, since then. Andrew, uh, I know you're aspiring to be a pilot. And right now you are um, working as um, a gate manager at JFK. I'll let you tell people about your role, what you do exactly, and um, what got you started with that. Yeah. So just first off, I agree with Ivana about the money part. So I was just chatting with one of my friends who has who's a year younger than me and he has his ppl and he has he's working on his uh instrument rating right now and he's just jokingly saying like hey you know what the two main factors that kills a pilot or like test a pilot is are the two main factors it is money and time and if you don't have either of that you're you're done right so um adding on to the point of like money and time is very, very valuable. And those are one of the currencies that, you know, is very, very valuable in our world. And that's what's needed to become a pilot. And uh, it tests how much you are willing to sacrifice to pursue the goals or the dream. So a little bit about me, I'm currently, I do not have any licenses for flying yet, but I do plan on getting one soon. Um, we're willing, but my current role at JFK is, um, a turnaround coordinator for Korean Air, but to go all the way back of what got me started, you know, what sparked this flame or this passion for aviation was around four years old when we were flying back to Taiwan, right? And we're in JFK terminal one and then just looking out at like the big, big aircraft and I see, I saw like four engines and I was like, wow, that that's like the iconic plane. And later I realized it was the, the queen of the skies, right? 747. And uh, I actually didn't know that, but later I realized that I got to fly in one of the 747s and I'm like, 
this that's that's a dream come true um and then just later realizing that wow you know this this metal you know cylinder can carry so much weight and you know affect lives and globally you know and i want to be part of that um and then during my you know school starting from like homeschool i I was homeschooling for a bit so around um i would say 15 years old when i went to public school in new york city um we had this volunteer program called key club and i was volunteering with them because they had an air show and that's what got me started right so there was a key club um air show called kiwanis kid state at LaGuardia airport and in there there's like all these like airliners so parked and allowing the people to who visits the air show to just go in the aircraft look you know go in the cockpit you know move around the joystick the yoke the throttles the rudders you name it right and i was doing all of it um and thankfully all the planes flew because i was pressing all the buttons that i could get my hands on right (laughs) um but at that event, um, I met a very crucial, you know, uh, group called Silver Patrol, and they are Air Force Auxiliary, um, and that's what got me started into pursuing aviation. Because I personally also had another dream of joining the military, um, hence why I'm wearing the Air Force cap. Um, but I want to fly and be part of the military. So that's what got me started. And if I can do combine all the dreams at once, you know, killing all the birds with one stone, that's like a fantastic thing to do. So I wanted to pursue Air Force and also fly for Air Force. Um, so I joined the program and for I am currently in the programs for around five years already. Um, but through this program, I had the privilege of flying and taking controls. So we have this thing called orientation flights or O flights. So we would go to airport and we would get on our Cessnas and just fly up. And then once we're in our cruising altitude, the instructor pilot would give us the cadets, the controls, you know, and they would make us, you know, talk to ATC, climb to a certain rate, bank, you know, turn and my very first time of just holding the controls and then the rudders it made me feel like wow you know this feeling is surreal you know the just a slight amount a slight push or pull on the yoke can make my gut feels like ugh, right um and then especially when you're turning and then when you're turning and pulling the yoke back it just feels like you're in a roller coaster ride and then your gut is just jamming down to the seat um and then my instructor pilot said imagine pulling that for multiple g's like five g's and that's what fighter pilots feels like five times worse than that um and that made me realize like wow this is awesome and i really do want to continue to fly and that continue sparked my little flame of for aviation into like a little a, a larger flame and as i you know progressed in this cadet program once i turned 18 or so yeah it's the last year so i'm currently 19 but once i turned 18 it's like you know what i need to work so literally a year ago i'm sitting at this desk applying for jobs and in my head's like you know what i like aviation but I cannot fly yet. Can I get myself close to aircrafts, right? Or close to pilots and talk to them. So I applied for um, a job at LaGuardia at first because I do not want to deal with big aircrafts because it's just a complex thing. And um, a few weeks later, I got a phone call. I was like, hey, can you work at JFK? Because we need a special position called turnaround coordinator. Can you do that for us? And plus you get like $2 more. And in my head, it's like, oh, yeah, two dollars more. Of course, <laughs> I'll do it. You know, but it's a longer distance, but I'll do it. So I said yes to the opportunity. And then, since last December, I started my very first job working at JFK with Swissport. And I started out as a passenger, as a check-in agent, right? And just checking in passengers, understanding the details, 
of documentation, the importance of customer service, and also back tag, like tagging bags. Um, if you notice, right, sometimes an experienced check-in agent, they would make sure that bag tags are as close to the handle so the bag tag doesn't slip off. Or if you would notice that the lip, the, after they tag the bag, they would put the little sticker on the other side of the bag. It's because when we're scanning, when the bag is on the belt, they would scan to the right bag room. So that's just a little side note for all of you who are listening. So um, working there for a bit, and then after a few months, I got my seal, which is a custom seal um, for custom US border protection. So that allows me to go to the ramp and be next to the aircraft and go in the aircraft. So after that, I've been working on the ramp, um, coordinating flights. And you know, a little bit more about my job is that I'm ensuring the safety and making sure that the flight, you know, is is safe and the ramp, the the, the gate or the apron is ready for the flight. And then once the flight is blocked in, I make sure that everything's offloaded in the right order, right? And everything is done in an orderly fashion, in a safe way. Um, and then after that, I would create the load plan, give it to the ramp crew, and they would load the aircraft. And I also need to be inside the aircraft to make sure that everything's loaded in the right position and the locks are up. So in other words, like I'm basically – in supervising or overseeing most of the ramp operation and just making sure that, you know, I'm the final check for everything. Um, so just, that's just a little bit about me. And I feel like I'm just talking a lot about my job because this is, <laughs> this is what I love. So <laughs> well, a lot um, to that job. But anyways, um, back to you. Yeah. I, I wanted to kind of touch on that aspect of, again, as you guys can he, let's hear, you know, just all these different um, parts of the aviation journey, uh, whether it's at the airport or even just, you know, the different uh, licenses in the air. So for you guys, um, and we're kind of coming around to Ivana and Amy answering first as well. What would you say is um, something that as you went into your journey, uh, to get your license, uh, you something that you didn't expect, you know, like it, it was a passion for you guys. That's awesome. But was there anything that you're like, hmm, didn't know this was part of it, you know? I didn't expect that communication between me and my instructor would be so difficult because that was what I essentially was paid to do in the previous job that I had, the previous career I had in media was to be as clear as possible and anticipate anything coming um, get a plan of action together and just be really adept at talking. But there was an unspoken communication in the distance between my instructor and myself, which happened to show itself over and over again. Um, I had a lot of instructors due to just the turnover rate at my flight school was insane. But it was always like I couldn't figure out the puzzle, which it kind of set me back mentally because... Um, Teamwork is so important to me. And the degree that I was working on before I changed its aviation was leadership. I also did the signature leadership courses with Unbound, highly recommend. But it was hard for me to be so bad at something that I loved. And I knew how crucial it was in aviation that our lives completely depended on how well we could work well together. And so even in private, there were the same things popping up, the same scenarios or challenges that required a lot of me mentally and emotionally. And because my skill set was so new, my brain would always go straight to the skill set first because it was concentrating and trying so hard. I think a lot of balls got dropped and it took me a while to to reach that point where I could handle more than, I don't know, 18 things at once and that I did not see that coming. So it's soft skills are important, hard, hard, hardware skills, software skills, that whole dynamic. But even more so is the person in the three and a half feet of the flight deck next to you. Like that's, that's kind of sometimes the most important thing. And, and that can be solved on the ground too. 
And it, it, if you go through the extra effort of connecting or talking with that person before you even climb in the plane, it will reap major benefits for you and the other person and like your own training. Yeah, that is a huge thing with instructors. And I had a ton of instructors too. And the last one I had, who I would hope would love to fly with again, he was awesome. But also, uh, when you first said communication, I thought you were talking about like literal communication, you know, uh, headsets and crappy old uh, radio systems and stuff in those old planes. Because I remember my first uh, flight with one of my instructors in the Super Cub. Uh, our headsets were acting up and we couldn't hear each other. So we literally chucked them and we were just yelling at each other. And I wouldn't recommend that because um, you totally mess your ears up. But um, it's really loud in those little cockpits. But Pro tip, if anybody's looking to get their pilot's license, budget like a thousand bucks for a headset up front and you won't be disappointed. <laughs> I feel that, Ken, because I'm I'm using a headset that like buzzes in one ear and I've convinced myself that it won't bother me. But at this point, I'm just like, I'm just used to like that one side just buzzing. Um, that's a good question, Abe. I would say what surprised me and <laughs> I guess I should have seen this coming. <laughs> Cardinal directions are way more important than than I thought. Um, I thought I could dodge that because people would tell me all the time, you know, I'm heading north on 95. And it was like, no, no, I want to GPS it. But you, it came back. It full circle <laughs> came back and like hit me, sideswiped me. Um, so cardinal directions came back. They, it, there's a lot more math involved than I thought. I don't know why I wasn't expecting there to be math, but I was like, I finished math in school and it's back. And really like what y'all were saying too, like how bad do you want it? I was like, well, I want it, I want it pretty bad. So I guess I'm just going to hunker down here. Um, and I think, uh, something that I wasn't expecting too. aviation just kind of, it, it was there when I was 17, I was with an unbalanced student and we were making this like list of all the things we want to do, like a bucket list. Well, I wrote in this journal and the first thing on that list was I wanted to learn how to fly. Well, I lost that journal for like so many years, found it again this year. And I was like, oh my gosh, we did it. Like that little Amy girl was like, we did it. We came full circle. Um, but I think a slight a bit of imposter syndrome too, like it, it feels kind of outside of my wheelhouse. Like I'm not a mechanic. I, I didn't grow up doing like drive this little yellow bug. I don't know how anything works. You know, I don't even drive a stick. So it's, <laughs> it's so sure. outside of my wheelhouse. But at this point, it's like, I can't keep saying it's outside of my wheelhouse because I'm the pilot in command for half of these flights. And I'm the one landing the plane and I'm the one doing the pre-flight. And I was like, it's not outside of my wheelhouse anymore because I, I added it in. Um, so yeah, cardinal directions. That, that comes back. That's important. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Amy, it's interesting that you said it comes full circle because did it come a full 360 degrees? Thank you. Thank you. And then that, thing, that also came back and it was like, oh, which makes so much sense. But <laughs> I nobody warned me. Nobody, nobody did. Um, yeah. But it's probably mm -hmm. good because it's good. We got there. Well, math was one of the reasons why I postponed flying for as long as I did, because I didn't, first of all, I didn't know anything about flying or learning to fly. I just figured that people were really good at math. I didn't, and then my head, I don't even think I defined it. It just was really good. People are really good at math and I'm really not good at math apparently. So therefore that big discrepancy um, was a reason for me to hide away and self-sabotage and be like, well, I should stick to something realistic, something that I can do, something in the arts, something in blah, blah, blah. We've heard it all. So I, I honestly think that you just have to try it. And the great thing about aviation, especially in America, it's also like this all over the world, is that things are so highly regulated that even training is regulated. Everything that you're going to be tested on or need to know will be directly explained for you in a government-issued handbook, which is completely free for you. You don't really have to pay for that study material. And they cannot test you on those things that are not in that book. So there is a limit to the knowledge and especially with technology um, and some smaller piece of technology, which is like the, you know, like the flight computer, which looks like a slide ruler. 
even that is a big shortcut. So you just understand that there are shortcuts out there designed for you um, because there's just so many pilots and like, there's no way that we'd have so many if it was that hard. So that's also something is that you just got to try it and trust um, the structures that are in place that you're going to make it and you're going to learn what you need to learn. The uh, wind correction uh, calculator on the, uh, what, what's it, what's it called again? The, E6B. It, it starts with an E. E6B, yeah. yeah. Those things, that wind uh, calculator, wind, what, what's it called? Your crosswind correction calculator on that thing? That is a lifesaver. <laughs> At least when you're learning to fly in South Dakota and every day is like 40 mile an hour winds. <laughs> exactly. I will say, I mean, on that fun note, I have also touched or flown uh, a small Cessna. Uh, I was with my good friend Scott. Shout out to him. He is a pilot as well. Um, this was my first time in his Cessna. And um, it's just like crazy. This was uh, actually, now that I think about it, um, almost exactly several years ago, I believe like three, four years ago. Um in November, so it was surprisingly windy in Florida already, or it's like Georgia, Southern Georgia. And um, yeah, I had some Chick-fil-A before. I flew the plane, crosswinds are going. I went all over the place. I asked him to take over. I lost all my Chick-fil-A. And <laughs> that was a fun experience. And um, yeah, Scott landed that plane with a direct crosswind, which was very impressive. Uh, it really, like the the alarm was going off and everything. It was really dramatic. Um, so Did I you mean, clap? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, shameless plug. There's a, a short video. I did about that. So, hey, Michael, we'll link it in the in the notes below. Again, shout out to um, Scott. Hey, everyone. David here with a short break in the episode to let you guys know about one of our programs that Unbound has going on right now. Registration is open for the Ascend Semester program. Now, if you've been around Unbound, if you've are been familiar with us for some time, you know that our biggest program is our Ascend program, which is a higher education alternative that equips students for the real world by teaching them valuable, practical life skills and give, engaging them in a uh, purpose-driven community. So with our Ascend Semester program, what we've done is that we have compacted the full Ascend program into just one spring semester duration. So it starts in January. Students will get to come to our base camp event down in Gulf Shores, Alabama, and they'll get to experience a lot of the same amazing things you get to experience in the full Ascend program. Things like expert Ascend webinars every month. Uh, they get to join a team of like-minded students. They get to work on a project, an Ascend project, and plenty more great things in the program. So if you want to learn more, you can visit beunbound.us slash semester. Enrollment for the program closes on January 6th, so make sure that you check it out soon. That is beunbound.us slash semester. Link will be in the description down below as well. Now, back to the episode. But with that, yeah, I mean, I want to hear about some of your experiences. You guys have had way more experience with flying as well as you, Andrew, on the ground. Um, a lot of the aspects to uh, <laughs> like tips on getting people on airplanes. So, yeah, what was uh, one of your favorite instances, a favorite story for you guys um, over the you know those past few years of flying or working at airports? Most of mine, I probably shouldn't say on a recorded call. Um, <laughs> Disclaimer right here again. Ian, fun Michael, fact, uh, this is recorded <laughs> and this is a podcast and people are listening. And I personally will share this podcast to your friends, my friends, and everyone. So um, feel free to as share. As long it. as it's not the FAA. But I'm trying to think of a good one to share. Probably almost getting landed on top of by an air coop was quite entertaining and i can share that one because that was his problem and not mine but uh basically we had a another plane an air coupe which is a funny little plane you should look it up if you're interested coming in the same traffic pattern that i was on the runway waiting to take off for but it's a little grass runway 
he, he's coming around and we can hear him faintly on the radio calling his um you know so when you're coming in a traffic pattern to to come land your plane you call your downwind you call your uh base and you call your final which is so downwind is basically you're going parallel with the runway but in the opposite direction that it runs and base you're turning towards final final you're you're shooting that approach and you're gonna get right on the runway and land um so he's calling his i think he called it base and we were like hmm that's interesting we should really make sure he knows that we're here so we make a radio call we say we're you know holding show or on runway two one and then he calls he calls final and we're just like freaking out my instructor's in the back seat and he's like absolutely going ballistic because this guy's like not very far behind us and is just oblivious to the fact that we're on the runway i don't know if he was blind or what and he goes and he's just yelling at me he goes as because the the thing was there was an intersecting runway this is why i couldn't take off and get out of the way and there was another plane landing on that runway that intersected the one that i was trying to take off on so he said he goes as soon as that effing plane gets across the runway you effing go and get out of here and i'm like okay we'll do and so that's what i did and we got up and literally as soon as we turned crosswind we uh looked down and saw that air coop that was behind us like at the hangar so he was like right behind us so that I, it kind of gives me sh- chills thinking about it but that was a crazy story so the moral of the story is don't don't land, land on the runway the goal is is to land on, on the runway and make sure the runway is is clear is clear for you to land i was gonna say i, I don't think i have a, a crazy story i have a really sweet one though um, I fly this this little yellow plane. <laughs> yeah, I drive a little yellow bug, and at this at this airport, it's a little yellow plane, and its name is Lupe. It's from San Diego, and it was a really sweet Tuesday morning. It was really early in the morning. There's like no clouds in the sky, and it's a beautiful blue sunny day. Um, I work in marketing and I start work around 8 a.m. So I was up really early. And um, my flight instructor is this sweet little grandpa who's been flying his entire life. And his whole passion is just to get people into the air. And you can just feel it from him. He's so, so sweet. And I get this text that says, hey, this little yellow plane is waiting for you. And today, today can be your solo. So I roll up and he would always tell me, he's like, Whenever he knew I was ready, he's like, I think you're ready, but you have to know you're ready. And when you know you're ready, you can go. And it was, it was just this moment, like it all came together. And it was this really sweet moment too, because it, the conditions were great. I flew it. I got back down. He's like, Amy, what was your first thought? And I was like, it just, it felt so right. Like it felt right to be in the air, felt right to be in the little yellow plane. And it's, it was, I think it's a sweet moment that I continually hold to beyond that too, that you can have, you know, all these dreams. You can work really hard towards things and it really will. Like it'll come together. You don't know when that Tuesday morning is going to come, but there's that Tuesday morning and you'll get there. So that was, that was really sweet. I loved that. Amy, that's the best story ever. I was transported listening to that and every pilot deep down wants that story. So I'm really glad that you were blessed with it. Um, and treasure that and know that there will be more, definitely more. Just to jump in, I'm jealous. I want that instructor. <laughs> I know. I want that instructor too. I think we all want that instructor. Yep, me too. <laughs> I, I kind of have one now, but I just need a plane again. <laughs> hmm. Be nice to your instructor. There we go. Another pro tip on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, because most flight instructors now, right? They're very, very young. And the reason why they're flight instructors is because they're getting their flight hours so they can move to um, an airline. So an old grandpa who's very, very kind and loves aviation is willing to teach. It is very, very rare. Um, so that's, that's most flight instructors out there. That's why I, would, I want a grandpa who has wisdom, knowledge, experience, and fun stories. I'm pretty sure he's funny too, by the way, how you share him. And, and share like I, I can just feel it. I can imagine it. Um, I, I was definitely transported to the story. So I'm very, very happy for you, Amy. 
I will say um, another tip that I just thought of for anybody looking to get into this is choose your instructor very wisely and uh, don't be afraid to fire your instructor. Take that with a grain of salt. But like, if you think that your instructor isn't really teaching you that well, um, find another one because it's going to cost you a lot of time and money to be butting heads with an instructor that just isn't working for you. So yeah, another pro tip there, I guess. And when you choose your own instructor, sometimes you don't really know what to look for, especially if you're so new, is talk to someone who's a couple levels ahead of you and ask them for some questions that you might want to ask that instructor um, for it's essentially a job interview. I was not blessed with that opportunity. The flight school I went to, I had zero choice in my instructor, which was part of the bigger problem. Um, so there was a lot of adaptability that I had to learn. And there's also an FAA book called the flight instructor's handbook or like the aviation flight instructor's handbook. It's online. You can Google it. You can just Google that title. As long as it says, says FAA, it might come up as a PDF. If I had read that entire handbook, or at least chapters one through three, which is like what the instructor is there to do and what their, um, the whole like essence of teaching and also what the FAA wants and they want to preserve it like through time consistently. Um, if I had read that, even at the pre-solo level, I would have really helped myself out because there's so many ways to like mitigate the problem. You know, there's so many ways to bypass the issue, understand where they're coming from, understand what you need understand what they're trying to do and use like some common language because it's required reading to become a flight instructor. So as a student, if you read that, you're basically speaking your instructor's language. Um, I would have really helped myself out so much because I didn't have the ability to choose my instructor, but I did at that time, un unknown to me, have the ability to talk at the, my instructor's language if I had only read that document, which is free. So that's my little advice as well. <laughs> Really appreciate that. Definitely note it. Definitely note it. Um, I, after this, I'm putting this on my uh, Kindle. Um, but as for stories, I don't know. I, I don't think I have cool flying stories because I personally don't have the privilege to fly yet. Well, tell us some of your airport However, stories. Yeah, plenty of those. I, yeah. I do have quite a bit. Tell us um, your gate on stories. Good tell side, us though, one. <laughs> Okay, so just a little side note for Korean Air, um, since it's one of like the major airlines, we have a lot of celebrities flying with us. So a week ago, I have this K-pop group called Itzy, and I did not even know that they were on the flight until the check-in agent, after the flight pushed back, after the flight left, and then the check-in agent's like, hey, yo, did you know Itzy? And it's like, no way, they were on board? So... There's a lot of celebrities, um, and that's just being the perks of just working with a major airline. And, and yeah, I mean, I don't know if the if you all know, but some of the listeners might know who I'm talking about. But there's this actor um, from Korea called – I don't know his – I don't want to butcher his name, but then he's the actor from Descendants of the Sun or Mr. Vincenzo from Netflix. Um, and I was the one who checked him in. And when I was looking at his passport and then him, I was like, no way. This got to be fake. Like, are you the actor from um, Descendants of the Sun? And like, yes. Yes, I am. And like, no way. One thing that I regret not doing because I was so embarrassed to do was I did not take a selfie with him. I should have taken a selfie with all the celebrities I, I've met. But um, besides celebrities, we do have a lot of you know, officials, like government officials. So one time we, we had like the Mongolian prime minister and um, the Singapore uh, ambassador. So on those like high official flights, we do have firearms. And I'm the one who needs to make sure that it's loaded properly and go through customs, you know. But yeah, so those are some of the cool story. Well, like cool events that I get to be part of. I'm not sure about his stories, but um, but yeah, so th I'm just very glad to be a part of this environment, I guess. But yeah, like working at the airport, if you're in charge of something that is other than yourself, it can be very humbling. Uh, and uh, an advice for everyone is 
after action report or anything with, you know, feedback, take it with a grain of salt and do not take things personally because the feedback is always helpful. The way how it is presented to you can be very hurtful. But at the end of the day, remember that the message and then the principle that is being taught through the through the mistakes that we've all been through is is crucial. Because for me personally, I learned a lot through my own mistakes. And it, like it or not, it scarred me. Um, and I, if it scarred me, I'd rather have the lesson learned so I don't have to do it again. Um, so one of that story would be... Okay, I'll, I promise I'll just share this one story. So, we're, one of my very first days on the ramp, right? Um, we were about to push back. So, I was working for this airline called Ita Airways, formerly known as Alitalia. And we were about to push back, and the GPU was still plugged in. So, GPU stands for ground power unit, right? So, we had that plugged in. Um, everything was locked up on the ramp. The cargo, the bulk was locked up. The tractors would, was attached. Boarding was done. And we were about to pull the jet bridge, right? However, we can't because the GPU was still plugged in because the GPU is attached to the jet bridge. The station manager did not know that I was new. So he just kept on yelling over the radio. He's like, how come we're still not pushing back? What's up with the GPU? The APU is on. So the APU is the auxiliary power unit. So that's located at the tail of the aircraft. And it's the the engine that power is the little engine that powers all the electricities in the aircraft without the engine turning on. Right. So um I was get I was getting yelled at over the radio without even without the station manager even knowing me. And later that wasn't enough for him. So he went down to the ramp and they saw a different person and yelled at me because he did not know me. And I, I messed up on, on my very first day of the job, right? Because the person who was supposed to train me um, was injured. So his leg was caught, what was smashed by another uh, belly cart or baggage cart because it wasn't locked properly by other from other agents at other gates. So the wind was windy and it just blew over. He tried to stop it he, and he tried to run, but it was just too fast. So um, he eventually was injured. And that was why I got yelled at because it was my very first day. I, I was clueless. Um, but one thing that I did learn is to, you know, always be humble. If you don't know anything or if you don't know anything, feel free to ask others around you. Because if you show that, hey, I'm willing to learn. However, can you help me out? Because I'm still not 100% sure on this. At the end of the day, all of our job is safety. And we would be more than happy to help each other out if it's, you know, the common goal for everyone. Um, so, yeah, that's a humbling lesson that I've learned. <laughs> to that point, um, I appreciate that, Andrew. And, hey, we say an unbound a lot. Failure is an option. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. And it is about communication. Again, another thing that I think we talk a lot um, just uh, within Unbound, but it's just so practical as we go into whatever industry we're in, all the other ones, especially aviation. So as we close out the episode, um, I want to ask you guys uh, something. What is something that you would say to someone else who is considering aviation, becoming a pilot or being part of the aviation industry. What are some of the lessons you learned? What is some advice you would give? And I love how we have some tips already throughout the episode. So guys, hope you're taking notes somewhat. Um, but also, yeah, what are some of the things that you're looking forward to? Um, Ivana, we'll start with you again. Um, you have been on the show and uh, we will be linking that below. Really recommend uh, everyone listening to that to kind of get your backstory. Super cool. Uh, what's next for you? What have uh, you learned? What are some things you would pass on to the next generation of you know pilots? One of the things I'll have to clear up because this is the part two, essentially, um, in part one of the podcast that I did a few years back, I was given that question at the very end. And I said that the Air National Guard was next for me. I was going to go be a military pilot. I was going to start really trying to get into officer training school and fly heavy aircraft or fighters, whatever. I could do it all, right? And I truly still believe that. There's there's a part of me that is 
the undying and always fixed on the mastery of all things that are hard, complicated and require so, so much of me. Um, demonstrating my skills, synthesizing all my knowledge and mastering the aircraft and the mission, the sense of mission. Like I will never not like that. Um, life has changed. <laughs> life has changed. And I think, um, that is a big lesson within the biggest lesson of all, um, is that you have to accept that in life. You have very few choices if you think about it. Um, time and money is also important. So look at what you do, what you can leverage. But for me, I think one of the hardest lessons to learn was that I, I am a gift and the gift is being myself. And although I possess the ability to do things myself, what I wouldn't be this gift of a person to others essentially. And I don't have a magic crystal ball. I can't anticipate who I'd be with everyone in every circumstance, but something deep down inside. And I've had to go back and forth through that through the years as I've like decided against this is that I wouldn't be the best of version of myself to others. And, um, and I'm going to have to take a leap of faith in that and rel relinquish that dream in, in a little bit of a way to God and what he has for me. Another reason why I didn't want to go to the airlines is because I thought they were boring. And I thought that the military would just always challenge me and that I would be around people who would be just like me. Um, and it was just so much me, 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 like everything I'm saying is me and the airlines are going to be boring and it was going to be full of passengers, but God truly led me into the current job that I have I currently work for an airline Envoy air. It's part of American and just being on the inside and seeing how the airline works from the back end, just with HR. Cause I'm, I'm an HR right now and pilot recruiting. So the hiring and processing of pilots for this airline, and I'm just starting to see from the inside out that that it's it's actually a really good life and it's actually really really fun and it is what you make of it and i'm never going to be bored because i'm going to bring myself and all of the goodness that i have to every flight every gate agent um every customer service representative every passenger um every situation that's maybe not so fun i truly think that i have that ability to be myself and be that gift that i am in all of those situations and I also will take full advantage of all my flight benefits and travel fun places. It's as simple boarding an airplane with non, non revenue flight, like standby essentially is think about it. Okay. Where, where would you be in two hours of a drive from where you are? For me, I would be in like Sedona, Arizona or something like that. Well, a two hour flight could get me to Dallas. A two hour flight could get me somewhere in California. Cool. Like San Francisco. That's how simple it is. And then it just kind of hits me that, you know, I, I have the ability to make to make this a part of my my life, just as simple as it would be to drive somewhere. It's also simple to get on a plane and just go experience something, go experience a new city, um, and get to know the world that I'm in, get to know God, get to know where He's placed me, and enjoy enjoy life. Um, so having to accept that has been hard, but it's a good thing, and I think that's definitely where the Lord wants me right now is in the airlines and all that. Um, so that's what I'm looking forward to is just growing in this love for the airline life that I had stiff armed for so long. So far, I've already met really awesome people, better, better people than I ever thought I could meet. Um, just within, <laughs> just within pilot recruiting, we have pilots that fly on the weekends with the airline and then Monday through Friday work in office with us. I'm, I'm remote. So I try as best as I can with video calls, but we do events together. So there's a lot of traveling and the pilots are with me. And we are shoulder to shoulder talking to candidates or talking to recruits, talking to people, explaining what the life is like, explaining the basics and the pay and the complexities and hearing the pilots on right or left side of me who do this every day. They love it. Um, they're even recruiters as well. And so I've met some of those people and it's just really kind of shown me that all those pilot people that I wanted so desperately to know and to meet like those who had like the true heart for flying, you know, the wisdom, the decision making, um, like that essence, I found them and I didn't, it wasn't going to be in flight school. I clearly, but I, it, it finally found me again and, and they're here with me and they're here at this airline. And, and so it's just a, like a foreshadowing, foreshadowing of things to come that they're there. And I was so quick to write it off before even trying it. So that's, that's where I'm at with, with that. And um, my, my goal is obviously now is to be a first officer with Envoy 
Um, just really great company, but, um, I still need my 700 hours. So here we go. Time to make a, a plan of a, a plan of attack, which it's going to look like me investing more money, which I'm currently building my finances back. Thank you, God. Um, and getting back into the airplane because I have not flown in such a long time. I'm pretty rusty, but I'm going to be going to Texas here soon and flying. I need 10 hours with an instructor and I found a good one. So 10 hours is going to get me back on the horse to then when I go home, like budgeting some money and time every month, rent a plane, rent a plane, that kind of thing. Stay fresh, hit my threshold of savings, be a flight instructor, see what I can do part-time. If I have to go full-time flight instructing, I will, but um, it's getting a lot clearer. And I'm so thankful because if you had talked to me about eight months ago, um, before this job or before any of these opportunities, I truly had no true options and was just very locked up in myself. So yeah, the, um, the setbacks are going to come in the aviation. There will be setbacks in terms of money, um, financial stuff, uh, emotional stuff, family stuff. Um, economy is huge too. You know, that sometimes it's just not the best time. Um, or just even like your medical, like if you run into some health problems and needing to figure what that looks like, there will be setbacks. So understand that you're like, your life is more than just aviation and who you are on the ground is the same person you are in the sky. So if you take that time to focus on yourself and, and the Lord and what's next, you, you'll be able to build some resilience that eventually you'll be, you'll get back in the plane. And, and you need to surround yourself around people who are going to tell you that, that you're going to get back in the plane. So choose people to tell your story to and where you're at and just listen to their hope and believe on their behalf, even if you don't believe in yourself. Thank you for sharing that, guys. You heard it here. I mean, we're going to get Yvonne on the podcast again like two years later. <laughs> Check in and see where <laughs> things are. Um, I love that. Two years later, she should be flying us around. All right, and right we should ahead. have a podcast in her aircraft. I know. Right, Ivana? Wait, that would actually be kind of cool. <laughs> right? What, what, what flight, what, what aircraft do you, do you normally rent? What aircraft do I normally fly? Yeah, or or rent because like if it's a Piper, I think you can have five seater. If it's a Cessna, four seater, depending on the weather and the fuel. But hey, my Piper is two pilot, co pilot. Yeah, it. the Piper <laughs> Piper is well. I mean, it depends on the plane. I've, I've I was trained in yeah, I was trained in Pipers, so there was just basically a bench seat in the back, um, and then of course like pilot co pilot seat. Um, but I. <laughs> I don't know how to rent airplanes. See, 300 hours, all these ratings. I don't know how to rent a plane. Uh, my school was, everything was just decided for me to show up and fly. So that's another skill I'll be gladly walking into is learning how to be this self-sufficient, um, freedom loving pilot that just knows how to do stuff like that, which it's going to, it's going to happen. But, but maybe, <laughs> maybe a vlog one of these days. I'd be up for it. <laughs> there you go. Love it. Uh, Key and Amy, any last and yet, last thoughts before we wrap up. Yeah, I do. I'll jump in. I don't think mine are like as succinct and pulled together. But I would say if, if you have something that, do you ever just have this like, you can't get it out of your head and it's this thought and it's this every time it comes up in conversation, every time you see something about it and it's just, it's all enveloping. It's called a dream. And I, I would pass along to to anyone listening, if you've even listened this far and you're like, I, I'm still, every time you see an airplane, you're thinking about who's in that plane and where are they going? And could I be in that plane? And it's, it's, it's called a dream. And don't, don't ever lose that wonder. And whether that's for aviation, whether that's for writing, whether that's for art, whether that's for music, like what's, what's so beautiful is that that dream is it's for you, you know? And it's the other thing I would say is you, you don't need to rush. You don't need to rush because I think we're in this culture of immediacy and in this urgency. And I'm not saying don't chase things, but I am saying that if you look at like, even I'm going to speak third person for a second. If you look at even the timeline of Amy's life, like four-year-old Amy wasn't ready for this dream. That's when the dream was born. It was placed in my life, but four-year-old Amy wasn't ready for that dream. And 76 year old Amy is doing, oh goodness, even knows what she's doing at that point in her life. So it's, it's, it's okay to, to be where you're at now and to just, to be fully present in the moment and accept that it's like, 
those those dreams were placed there for a reason and it's cool to see how they come full circle so the full circle thing um and the last thing that i would say is that if you're if you're flying if, you, if you're in the plane if you're flying the plane you're a pilot if you're if you're writing you're a writer if you're running you're a runner if you're studying you're a student don't feel like you don't belong in that space because if you're doing it you're doing it go you go you well, shout out to Amy for always sharing us on and guys, um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing your, your time and your experience and your passion. It's something that, uh, I love. And especially this episode, this whole series of pursuits, you get to see the passion. Um, and you guys have really, really brought it today. So thank you for being on. Um, I'm excited because this is such a journey, especially I love talking with pilots where it's such a continual thing, right? And, um, we'll, we'll see next episode, uh, with you guys on a plane or something. We will see. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And we will see you guys around. Well, I do not think that episode disappointed. That is an excellent uh, just series of stories and uh, experiences and some wisdom from our uh, from our pilots. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Yes, sir. And so once again, uh, as Ivana has shared, if you're curious about Ivana's earlier story, some more details, I will definitely recommend and link below the episode that she was on this is like way back david this is episode 12 um so one of the first episodes we ever done on this podcast one of the first uh, interviews that our producer then ben billups interviewed and um yeah go check out her story uh if you want more information about any of these pilots or tips do uh email us we, we have our email and that's open for any questions that you may have david tell us about the email again that email is podcast at be us. you can email us anytime there so thank you all so much for joining us for this episode. This is the second to last episode of season five. So next episode is the season finale. And let me tell you guys, you are in for a treat of an episode. I think we're not going to we're not going to spoil it. We're going to leave it a surprise. We're going to make our next episode guest our season finale a surprise. But trust me when I say you are going to want to tune in for it. It is one of the best episodes we've done to date. It is a highly requested guest and you are not going to want to miss out on it next week. So thank you very much for joining us for this episode, and as always, be unbound.